Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Morning Light Bible Study. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is our daily devotional time that we go through the scriptures chapter by chapter. And we are currently working our way through Exodus chapter 30. And we covered verses 1 through 6 yesterday. And it's interesting that of all the artifacts, this, this part of the Bible deals with and speaks to God instructing Moses about the design of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Now, what was the tabernacle? It was the elaborate tent that was the focus of the worship of Jehovah. Mm -hmm. It was this tent with three compartments, and throughout these compartments it had various artifacts that were designed to facilitate the Israelites' approach to God. He came in and was confronted with the brazen altar where he made sacrifice for sin. The priest would move beyond that to the next compartment where there was the seven-branched lampstand and the table of showbread. And then the altar of incense, and beyond that was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant that Indiana Jones was looking for <laughs> uh, in that compartment. And above that Ark, this golden box, was the supernatural Shekinah glory of God that actually was the only illumination in that room. And of all of these artifacts and the design of them were covered up until the very last when the altar of incense was mentioned. Uh, when we, it was in one of the three artifacts in the second compartment, what they call the holy place. And earlier on in our study, uh, we saw that the table of showbread was provided for the seven-branched lampstand was provided for, but then we skipped. You'd think they'd do the third one. God would say, okay, Moses, uh, this is the, the third one. But he didn't. He then skipped and went out on to the first compartment talking about the brazen altar, which was where sin offering was made on a continual basis. And an Israelite could come uh, it was provided for that he could come and bring a sacrificial animal, and then there were various uh, sin offerings and consecration offerings given throughout the ceremonial year connected with the different feasts and such. But uh, then having instructed Moses about the brazen altar, then he takes him back. He says, okay, now let's go back in to the holy place, and let me talk to you about the final artifact, which is the altar of incense. It's almost like God was saying, this is where I'm trying to get. Mm -hmm. He's providing for uh, his presence. The first thing was the Ark of the Covenant, and that's God putting his presence in your life. The glory of God stood over, hovered over the top of this box. This box represents your heart. Your heart to God uh, is the equivalent of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was not uh, an end in itself. It was God saying, I'm giving you this gold box to say something about the human heart that I want to dwell in. And then he goes to the table of showbread. And Jesus said, healing is the children's bread. Jesus is the bread of life. I want to put my glory in you, he says. So here's the Ark of the Covenant, and here's how I'm going to do it. He gives us the bread of life. And, and then I'm going to illuminate you. He goes to the golden lampstand, which speaks about the illumination of God's word in our life, and it also speaks about the larger purposes of God, because that seven-branch lampstand is the church, the seven churches that Jesus appeared in the midst of uh, to John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. But then he goes to the brazen altar. He says, I want to be all those things to you, but I'm going to have to deal with sin. So let's deal with sin at the brazen altar, and now that we've got you provided for, we got your sin dealt with, now let me show you what I'm really after. And he takes us to the altar of incense, which represents intimate access to God. It mm -hmm. stood at the door or at the entrance uh, to 
the Holy of Holies. Beautiful. And remember, Jesus talked about, said you're going to go in and out and find pasture. The in and out is not the outer court uh, of the tabernacle. It's the veil that was rent in two when Jesus was crucified. That's where he wants you to go in and out. And when you and the, the means by which a priest was facilitated to go into the Holy of Holies was by first stopping at the altar of incense. And if you look in the book of Revelation, when John looked and he saw the angels taking the prayers, this incense was very sacred. You couldn't just go down to the, you know, for the hippies out there, you couldn't just go down to the head shop and get some vanilla incense <laughs> that was on the shelf next to a bong. And, you know, you, no, it, it had a specific um, ingredients. And you couldn't make anything else. It's, and you had to bring that. And then when you look in the heavenlies, you see the angels taking your prayers. And your prayers are the incense. Offering them to God is a sweet-smelling savor. And then they take those same coals of incense and hurl them back into the earth. And there's lightnings, thunderings, uh, and earthquakes. In other words, you offer the prayers up to God. He receives them on his altar of incense. He... he gives them back to the angels and the angels send your prayers back. That's why you pray the answer, not the problem. Amen. If you pray the problem, you get problems back. <laughs> uh, you pray the answer and those prayers come back to you after God receives them as a sweet smelling savor and they are filled with the power of God to come to pass in your life. Prayers are like requisition orders, like work orders. That's why, you know, he said, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. Amen. In other words, you have to, like God told Kitty, you got to tell me what you want. You know, you're going to have to ask me. Mm-hmm. Let your prayers be praying the solutions of your life, not the problems of, of your life. God did not look out at the earth that was without form and void and say, it sure is dark out there. Mm-hmm. He didn't do that. And Ephesians teaches us to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus be a follower of God, which means imitator. It means, who do you think you are, God? No, but I'm acting like God. I'm doing what God would do if he was in my shoes. Amen. And if God was looking at, if God was, you know, woke up this morning and was laying next to that spouse, if God was getting up, getting dressed, going to that job, driving that car, paying your bills, what would he do? That's what he wants you to do. And he's not going to be offended if you imitate him. He wants you to imitate him. Amen. And so when he, if he were to look out at your life, like he looked out at the earth that was at that form and void, what would he be saying? You know, bills, be gone. Marriage, be healed. Body, be well. Amen. See, that's the authority of the believer. And, and it's all focused around this altar of incense, uh, which represents intimacy with the Father. Uh, it's interesting, there's two altars. And this was not a sin altar. In the brazen altar, they offered lots of different offerings. They offered meal offerings, which were grain offerings. They offered meat offerings. They offered two basic kinds of offerings. There were consecration offerings, which was basically saying, God, I'm bringing this offering to let you know how much I love you. It was not a sin offering. Then there were sin offerings and trespass offerings. God, I, my conscience is defiled. I need to be cleansed. But the So there are many different kinds of offerings in the first altar, which was the first one you had to deal with when you came in to God's presence. But then the second one was you didn't offer animal sacrifice, grain, or anything else, just incense. That's it. Two kinds of, of altars. One deals, the, the brazen altar establishes your fellowship with the Father. The incense altar re- establishes your relationship with the Father. It's consecration and, and intimacy. And we, we talked all about this yesterday. And and now God uh, instructs Moses in the schedule. You know, is this is this something like I'll see you at Easter and Christmas? I'll see you <laughs> Easter and I'll see you at the Christmas cantata. You know, that in our culture that's more common than we care to care to admit. Or God I'll see you once a week. Uh, you know, no, you're going you're gonna to see words like the continual burnt offering. God's not interested in a visit. He didn't, you see, he's not like a deadbeat dad who wants to, you know, pay child support so he can get visitation. God wants a whole lot more from Amen. you than visitation rights. Okay. 
He wants continual habitation. He wants full custodial custody of your life. Yeah. And, uh, and so we're going to look now at the, the schedule that the incense was to be burned. And then we're going to talk about the shekel of the sanctuary, which was another uh, consideration addressed here in chapter 30. If you would read verses 7 through 10 of Exodus, lovey-dovey. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, I want to bump up back up to six because I like the last line of it. And thou shalt put before it the veil that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where the, I will meet thee. That's just powerful. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. And ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, or burnt sacrifice, nor meat offerings, neither shall ye pour drink offerings thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement for, upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in a year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord." And see what they would do once a year they would take and they would not offer an animal they would take the annual high holy offering for sin which represented Jesus dying for us they would take some of the blood and they would sprinkle it one time on the altar mm -hmm. in order to facilitate Aaron going behind the veil into the holy of holies and sprinkling the same blood in other words it gets sprinkled on the altar of incense in order to open the way, Jesus died, and he opened the way that they would then sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant. And Jewish tradition had a lot of thoughts about when it was sprinkled, sometimes it would it would get on the veil, and it meant certain things. Now, how they, they would, it's almost like... Uh, uh, when sacrifices were made and priests in pagan religions would read the sacrifice, they would look at it and read things by how the animal died and such. And the Jews, uh, when they would make this sacrifice, if the blood that was sprinkled, depending on how the pattern, how it fell, and if any of it got on the veil, it meant different things uh, to them. And, uh, and he was to burn this incense upon this altar every morning and every evening. And uh, if you study right and left in the Bible and morning and evening, you will find that the morning sacrifice is connected with power and the evening sacrifice is connected with worship. And we don't have time to go into that now. Just like the left hand is a is connected with, with worship or something spiritual where the right hand is connected with power and something natural. If you have a dream, you're dreaming about something taking place on, on the right hand uh, coming from the right, that's a natural something going on. If you're dreaming about something going on in the left, and it, then it has to do with the spiritual side of your life. And if you study these sacrifices, because I knew that these directions were important in dreams because dreams are symbolic. And, uh, and I studied these ceremonies, these types and shadows in, in the ceremonial law that God gave to Moses to determine the meanings of these different things. But he was to do it uh, morning and evening. You know, King David said early in the morning, I will seek you. There's something about setting uh, your day. When I, when I open my eyes in the morning, that my first thought is I'm just configuring my thoughts toward the Lord. Because if my thoughts go to my day, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be one off all day long, <laughs> trying to catch up. You know, Amen. when I worked in medical management, I had a very tough job. Uh, I had a lot of people to stay ahead of, and uh, because I was responsible. Uh, as a vice president of a medical management company. And uh, I would go in many times, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd have a full day done but by the time uh, the CEO of the company showed up, by the time the other employees showed up. 
because I wanted to be ahead of the game. And uh, But seeking God's face and my commute to work for many years, that was my prayer time. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would pop in that tape or that CD or whatever it was, and, uh, and I, would, I would pray out my day whenever I would, I would get to work. It's a good process. And then in the <laughs> evening, you know, to, to uh, decompress. You know, the scripture says, uh, don't go to bed angry. You know, don't let the sun go down on, on your wrath. And sometimes the way to decompress that is uh, tell it to Jesus. We, we make fun of that. You know, people that, uh, the old song, me and Jesus got our own thing going. But there's a sweet hymn that says, tell it to Jesus alone. Sometimes we're so busy. I tell people all the time, I said, you need to learn to limit your counselors. Mm -hmm. Because, you, you know, your counselors are only as good as the faith that they walk in and the love that they have towards you. Let me say that again. Your counselors are only as good at the level of their faith. Let's say you come to somebody and you got a great big problem and you tell it to somebody who doesn't have uh, faith for your problem. You'll walk away and their thought will be, boy, she is in trouble. <laughs> and they're going to counsel you from that perspective. And people have a, something called a human spirit. You don't war against flesh and blood, but that person has a human spirit that can act on you from miles away. It can act on you just like a demon spirit or an angel for that, for that matter. And it creates this, what I call, uh, Kitty and I call spiritual white noise, where you're, you're telling everybody your business. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens? You get confused. Because if you turn on the television and you don't have a channel lined up, you go where there isn't a channel and it's just that white noise and you turn that up, you can't think. Mm -hmm. You can't concentrate. Well, that's what many people being aware of the circumstances of your life who don't have faith for you or they have faith but they don't love you, then it creates all this spiritual white noise and you say, I can't hear God. Well, that's why. Mm -hmm. You need to learn how to do what Kitty calls go low and worship. Talk about the interference level, the first, second, third heaven, because the interference of demons. And sure. There are three heavens. My understanding of the heavens is the natural realm is the first heaven, the, the firmament, the, the primary firmament that you and I walk around in. The second heaven is what Jacob glimpsed when he uh, woke up in the night and saw the angels ascending and descending from the third heaven. The second heaven is the intermediate realm that angels and demons commiserate in. And they're in the room, they're all around you, but you can't see them. And the third heaven is where the throne of God is. We call the second heaven the air because Satan is the prince, the power of the air. Now, he is not there that by God's appointment. Mm -mm. You will not find a scripture anywhere that God appointed Satan, the prince of the power of the air. But he did tell Adam, uh, subdue, have dominion. He made Adam. Adam, Adam was the original prince of uh, uh, palatity of the air, the Amen. prince and principality of the air. Realm, But when Adam sinned, he advocated that and literally handed the keys of the kingdom, the keys of, of the earth, the second heaven, over to Satan. And it's been a battleground ever since. But Jesus bought it back. And so Jesus <laughs> bought it back, and notice what happened. Now, go to First Thessalonians, what is it, 517? Uh, or 4, I can't, uh, it's in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, where it talks about what some call the rapture of the church. Now, I want you to listen to what this says. I think language in the Bible is everything. It says that he shall descend from heaven, the third heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father with a shout. We which are the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air, air. second heaven. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? I heard it. Did you get it? He's coming down from the third heaven. We're going to be caught up out of the first heaven into the second heaven. And then the, the next part, now now think at that moment, uh, step over to Revelations chapter 12. There appeared in the heavens, second heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, travailing in birth. So the marriage supper of the lamb has been consummated with the bride, unless you think Jesus had, had uh, uh, conception with her before the marriage supper of the Lamb took place, and then a whole lot of conservatives are going to have a problem with that, because there was <laughs> no marriage first. Uh, 
Uh, so, so the Mary's Supper of the Lamb has happened. And this woman appears, and it's the it's the glorified church. You say, yes, that's right. And uh, and go back to Second uh, Thessalonians. It says, the Lord shall descend from the third heaven to the second heaven. We shall ascend from the first to the second heaven to meet him in the air. That's how we know the air is spoken of in the scripture is also a reference to the second heaven that Jacob witnessed to that Jesus told um, Nathaniel he would see the angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. And, uh, and then the next verse, the next part of that verse in second Thessalonians really talks to me. It says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So two things, we're ever going to be with the Lord, just so. Well, just so what? In that <laughs> second heaven. Mm -hmm. In that second heaven realm. And if you study Revelation 12, you'll see what that implies. The sun-clothed woman, the, the, the church is captured, raptured up to the second uh, heaven. She travails and brings forth a child who's caught up to God and to his throne, to the third heaven. And there's where you got to lose all your egalitarian concepts and democratic concepts of the new birth, being born again, and what it is to be in the economy of God. Because God doesn't treat everybody the same. Whatever the end time wrap up is going to be, it's not going to be God pulling some lever and everybody that signed a decision card is all going to get the same experience. The Bible plainly teaches there are levels of rewards, levels of access based upon the character of your interaction and your relationship with the Father. And there's some group within that body that's represented by the sun-clothed woman who is the glorified church that, uh, that there is something called the man-child. And the scripture talks about that all through the scripture. Now look, that's a buzzword. Oh, you're preaching manifested sons. Well, you better tear Romans 8 out of your Bible. If the, you know, I don't know about what everybody else says the manifested sons are, but I know when God talked about that in Revelation 8, he had, in Romans 8, he had something in mind. So whatever it is he had in his mind, that's what I'm touching. That's what I'm, I'm again, I'm more comfortable with my questions than I am with everybody else's answers. And, uh, but all I know is that there's something, uh, a, a man-child company, it's not one person, it's a man-child company is going to be caught up to God and to his throne. So think about that. We're going to be captured out of the earth and into the air realm to be, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then there's going to be something else coming out of the body of Christ that's going to be caught up directly into God's throne. We can't see clearly into that. Amen. There's something powerful there. And it's interesting that when that woman is captured up into the air realm, all of a sudden she's clothed with the sun. She looks like Jesus did on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? But my question is, where are we going? <laughs> you know, somebody talked about the rapture. And people, I've heard people teach, it's a planet called heaven. Oh my goodness, that's so <laughs> ignorant. Uh, Kenneth Hagin said, that's ignorance gone to seed. Uh, uh, my, think about think about it. If, if you're on different sides of the globe and we're all going to be caught up, which way is up? Mm. I, I think it's more accurately, it's a dimension. It's something we're going to step into. That's, that's all around us. And, and again, just feeling after that. And, and uh, boy, Brother Walden, that sure is a little unusual. Uh, well, let me tell you, I'm, I'm about as orthodox as I ever was in the things I'm assured of. That's right. But my questions, where my questions take me, I'm feeling after. I'm, I, I want more understanding, more truth, more access, more reality. Let me just, uh, to reiterate something we talked about earlier, when we, if you don't limit your counselors and you put your business out on the street in front of people who are really not consecrated to your, and devoted to your well-being, um, then that, that noise, that noise of those conversations goes straight up into that second heaven and the enemy accommodates that. So they got something to work with. That's why we don't gossip. We don't take, we don't gossip and we don't talk about people and their stuff and what we shouldn't discuss because the angels of, of, of God are listening, number one, but the demonic realm in that second heaven takes that information and uses it against those people. You know, they whisper and mutter in your pillow at night kind of stuff. So just be, be very guarded with your words. Words have power and we want to try to trim our words so that we're not saying anything that's not edifying. 
Repeat after me. Be a gatherer of information, not a dispenser of information. Amen. One of my mentors taught me that. Amen. Be a gatherer of information, information not, a not a dispenser of information. For goodness sake, keep your mouth quiet. Yeah, we have to and, make it be quiet. And particularly about things that matter in your life. You're out there always articulating all your vulnerabilities, issues, and problems, and you're getting more. It's like a piece of meat. The bigger, you, the more you chew it, the bigger it gets. And you have to learn. And, and just because somebody asks you a question doesn't mean you have to give them an answer. I That's love right. Dick Cheney. You know, Dick Cheney, they try and... Uh, nail him down and make him say something he didn't want to say and he'd say well i couldn't say that yeah or people would i've had people talk to me and and uh and want me to agree with them <laughs> this is a this is this is a, and they want me to say i agree and if i if i say i don't agree it's a fight if i say i agree i'm lying and i'm strengthening them in their immaturity so instead i look at them i say i understand <laughs> Even yesterday, somebody said to me, well, do you know what so-and-so said? And I said, I don't believe I want to know. Thank you. <laughs> That's exactly right. See, because words, words are powerful, and we need to trim our words. Amen. Study to be quiet, Paul said, and do your own business. I, I tell my grandkids, study to be quiet. Uh, and uh, mind your own business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so when they would burn the incense, Aaron was to burn this incense on the altar every morning and every evening. And this speaks of Jesus also, Hebrews 7, 25. Uh, Jesus, it says he is able to save us uh, to the uttermost. Uh, I remember heard a Bowery preacher down on Skid Row save you to the guttermost. Aww. She used to preach on Aww. the radio back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. I'm not that old, but my dad talked about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, those that come to God by him, see if he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Who's he making intercession for? Those that come to him. Amen. How do we come to him? By a new and living way that he is Whoa. consecrated that's typified by the tabernacle in the wilderness. But we don't even study these things. We're out there studying some, you know, we're, you know, we, we, we're using, we're talking about football games and, and contemporary things, whereas we have this whole scripture that we can go look and God is saying something to us. It's important for your, for your understanding of your access to God. And, and again, it speaks of the prayer life of the believer. It was something to be continually done. It was a constant, they called it a perpetual incense. And it represents your prayers. God wants your prayers to be uh, perpetual. Uh, Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Notice it's watching in prayer. Your eyes are never truly open until you close them in prayer. That's why I, God taught me when I was a baby pastor. He said, pray with your eyes open. And he wasn't talking about my physical eyes. Mm -hmm. You need to pay attention to what you see in prayer. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. In other words, you've always got a prayer going on on the back burner. Uh, you, you might be, you know, you're cooking your supper. I love to cook. And you're cooking and the phone rings or somebody knocks at the door. You push it to the back burner, turn it down on simmer. You're not going to stop cooking. You'll ruin your meal. But you need to deal with what's something else that's going on. So whatever you're doing, I keep a steady drone in my mind of praying in tongues. Called abasapa rabasata labakasta. It's like an undercurrent. <coughs> and uh, Colossians 4.2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. In other words, whatsoever things are good, pure, perfect, lovely, of good report, think on these things. Don't let your prayers be like these hokey, super spiritual pseudo prophets that during the worship service, they're up there, they're stalking the aisles with their arms crossed, stroking their chins, discerning the congregation Dear while Jesus. they're worshiping. Dear Jesus. Hello? Uh, you know, I want to take a guy like that and just shake him, you know, <laughs> whatever you think a prophet is, that's not it. That's being what the Bible calls a wizard mm -hmm. who peeps and mutters. Don't you dare let a prophet like that speak into your life. How many times have I had him come and hand us a CD with some condemnatory word where oh. they thought they were discerning us and it went right out the window before we left the parking lot. 
You don't need to let people like that anywhere near you, but they'll play on your insecurities and say, yes, I'm powerful in God. And uh, you're going to set yourself at a disadvantage if you don't listen to what I have for you. I have discerned your situation. And we're so insecure. Look, somebody like that comes, whatever their discernment is, if it doesn't match up with what God's telling me, God has a voice. And no matter how stubborn I might be, He has a ways and means committee to make sure that I've heard him. And I don't need to allow some person out there to appeal to my insecurities and to make me dependent upon them so that they can manipulate uh, me to be some sort of a stroke for their ego that they've confused ego with anointing. Mm -hmm. And there are people in your life that will torpedo the plan of God. Every time you are one step from breakthrough, this person in your life, and you'll know who they are because it's that person in your life you think you can't do without, but you never know where you stand with them. Right. One minute they're telling you you're a spiritual giant, and the next minute they're treating you like like you're the Antichrist. And you never know what side of the spiritual bed they're going to get get up on. And if you ever stand up in your security in Christ, they will drop you like a hot potato and they will have nothing more to do with you because they will only surround themselves with vulnerable, insecure, uh, uh, hurting people that they can manipulate in order to make themselves feel good because they're broken and fractured in themselves. And let me tell you something. You can't fix those kind of people. You cannot fix those kind of people. You got to let God have that person who's this A-type predatory person Mm -hmm. who's going to be pursuing after you and right about the time you're going to drop the hammer and just deal with it, all of a sudden they'll become so vulnerable and tender and sweet to you and cry and hug your neck and tell you how much they appreciate you. And then as soon as you back off and, and accept, allow them to solidify back into your life, here they go, putting you at it at not. Uh, speaking things to you that produce insecurity, vulnerability, uncertainty, confusion. These are contaminated relationships, and there are many of you out there that have these, and you need to drop the hammer on those and get those people out of your life. You don't, and you'll try to do that, and they'll level all kinds of intellectual, spiritual arguments against you. They will complicate that thing. They'll do it by loaning you money. They'll do it by getting involved in you with you in ways that are, you are not easily extricated from you need to sever the tentacles of python and get yourself free so that you could go on and do what god said do kitty and i had had people in our life uh, that were were moving in a spirit of python and we loved these people we had poured our life out to them like a drink offering and the lord woke us up four o'clock one morning and, and and told us with a very powerful witness that This is going to happen at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They're going to be in your office. They're going to make these demands. They're going to say these things. And when they got there, we were ready. We were ready for them. And we said, hey, all we want you to know, the last time we were with you, we were coming towards you in love. And we walked away from it. We severed those relationships. And there was a whole constituency of, of people that that they were connected with, that represented our field of ministry. And we loved those people and they loved us. And they were trying to use those relationships. They got on the phone and started calling everybody, every mutual acquaintance we had, trying to prepare them to put pressure on us to keep us under their thumb. Mm -hmm. And we simply said, no, that's okay. You want to play that game? We'll back off all those relationships. And we were utterly isolated. We went through several months. And then Father's Heart Ministry exploded. And then in that isolation, of course, they were saying our life was over, our relationship was going to fall apart, our finances were going to crash, our business was going to fail. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had all kinds of predictions they were putting down, down on us. And the exact opposite happened. Amen. Out of the ache and fracture and just the, the emotional devastation of these people that we love so mm-hmm. much, Aww. we decided to go low. And worship. We didn't answer our critics. Mm -hmm. People wanted us uh, to criticize those people. People wanted us to expose them. We refused to do that. We would not get stooped to that level. Mm -hmm. We trusted God. We went quiet. We said, we'll seek the kingdom. We'll seek first the kingdom. And the next thing that happened, Father's Heart Ministry uh, launched. Absolutely. 
And there are those of you need to hear that. You've been wondering why you keep going around in circles and Stagnation. butting your head mm -hmm. against uh, on this side of breakthrough. But there are relationships that you've got to jettison Amen. at all costs that you might walk into your victory. And the bottom line of that is that is that manipulation against you is human witchcraft. That's what it is. That is ungodly as all get out. And that's what they're working against you. Now, whenever they would offer this incense, again, we, we talked about it. They said no strange incense or other sacrifice could be made. In other words, you could not blend in worship of other gods. Mm -hmm. The culture they were in, they could have worshipped Baal. In fact, there were times they backslid and they did. They would wor offer offerings to Baal on the altar of incense. Oh, we would never do that today. Really? How many times have you heard by somebody say, Give me a preacher that steps on toes. We want a strong leader. Well, you know what the word Baal means? The children of Israel worship Baal for thousands of years. You know what it means? Dominative father. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You know what Jezebel means? Daddy's little girl. In other words, let me be the syncophant who's going to garner the, the uh, pat on the head from this really strong leader so I can feel good about myself and secure and I feel like everything's cool. Mm -hmm. you know. And that's exactly what we do. We're offering incense to Baal. We want somebody like a Saul, King Saul, head and shoulders above, above the rest instead of this little meek, uh, little, little shepherd boy with a slingshot in his pocket mm -hmm. shooting off his mouth about giants nobody else can conquer. You know, David is one of these guys who's going to talk about the 800 pound gorilla or giant in the room. You know, that that's the kind of leader that God anointed, that God that God called. We need to be careful. Who are we who are we offering up to? No mixture, no mixture, no strange sacrifice. There was no meat or animal sacrifice made on the altar. And that was all done on the brazen altar whose sacrifices represented the death of Jesus upon the cross. Uh, Christian culture, when it does encourage prayer, now what are we saying? The brazen altar dealt with sin. That's when you get in fellowship with God. The altar of incense deals with intimacy with God and your prayer life. Now, let's talk about your prayer life. Bra the brazen altar represents the sacrifice of Jesus. The altar of incense is your prayer life. Christian culture, when it does encourage prayer, tends to try to back it up with some kind of sacrifice but you were not supposed to offer any other sacrifice mm -hmm. on the altar that represented prayer. In other words, I'm not bringing my religious sacrifice, my religious performance. I'm not bringing all of my track record and my performance uh, values in, in terms of morality or Christian culture or religious performance as though God's going to answer my prayer. I'm not going to that altar of incense pointing to myself I'm going to that altar of incense and I'm pointing back to the brazen altar and say, the price is paid, let me pass mm -hmm. into the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. No other yep. sacrifice. See, where Christian culture tends to try to encourage prayer, yes, but to back it up with some sort of religious sacrifice. It could be anything uh, like getting up extra early to seek God or thinking that God is moved by your fasting. And we just finished some fasting. Fasting is important. It has its place. It has produced, too. But, but you need to know it doesn't move the hand of God. Okay, fasting changes you. Amen. Um, or even those who crawl, extreme versions, those who crawl on their knees on the, the Via Della Rosa, or those who flagellate themselves, uh, thinking that somehow God is moved by such uh, actions. All such thoughts of what moves the hand of God in prayer reflects a lack of faith in what Jesus, what God did for us in Jesus. We feel that what Jesus did isn't enough, so we add our piety, our religious sacrifice, our self-denial to our prayers, thinking that's what's necessary to be heard. Anything that you think is required in prayer beyond the sacrifice of Christ is the measure of your own unbelief. Mm -hmm. I'll say that to you again. Anything that, I know I had to hold my mouth just right, I have, to, uh, I have to chant, I have to have the incantation in the name of Jesus, or the incantation, I plead the blood of Jesus, and I'm not saying you can't do that, sure. but, when, but those things that you think are required in prayer many times are required in order to effectively pray in your own life, 
Those are the measure, that's the measure of your own unbelief and ability to have confidence in what Jesus did for you upon the cross. I'll share something from my past. As a little girl, I heard my daddy say, um, the Lord helps those that helps themselves. The Lord helps them that help themselves. All my life, I, I grew up then with a performance uh, mentality. I had to perform in order to be get, daddy's little girl. Be daddy's little girl and get all that God had for me. I had to perform. And I was, I mean, in my early 40s before I found out that the Lord helps those that uh, help themselves it was not even a chapter. It wasn't in a verse. It was just man-made. And I got got to break that off of me as, as a word curse, actually, over my life. And it set me free. So here shadowed in the design and placement of the altar of incense is a clear testimony that it is Christ alone and what he did for us that moves God to act. Not anything that we can do or say from the perspective of religious culture to affect answered prayer. See, the basis of prayer, I like what verse 10 says, you're making atonement, at one minute. Mm -hmm. I, my, whenever I first did a broadcast years ago, I called it At One with the Father. And it was based on the concept of atonement. The basis of prayer is the atonement of Christ. The word atonement means to expiate, condone, placate, or cancel. What placate? God, what's it going to take to placate you so you'll answer my prayer? Oh, I'm already placated. God looks at you. You need to answer the prayer. What, what Jesus did. God looks straight at you and he says, look here. Looky here. What Jesus did on the cross placates me in terms of answering your prayer. Quit trying so hard. In fact, many times God will hold back an answer to prayer because he sees you're trying to add something to what Jesus did. And if he answers the prayer while you think what you're adding to the prayer is going to bring the answer, then God would be colluding in your own self-deception in thinking that how you prayed or what you did, your religious performance. And so God holds back and says, I'm not, it's like a little boy holding his breath till he gets his candy bar. Go ahead. I'm not giving you the candy bar till you turn blue, pass out. And when you give up, then I'll let you have one. But I'm not going to let you think that what you're doing, your religious performance, by, by any kind of manipulation, adding something to the atonement of the cross to get answered prayer. And I think that creates the vast majority of an unanswered prayer and delay. God, what's taking you so long? Whenever your confidence is in Christ alone, you accelerate answered prayer. It means to, to be at one, to cleanse. What is it that cleanses you? Does suffering cleanse you? Suffering doesn't cleanse you. It means to disannul. Uh, you know you're not qualified to get an answered prayer, you rascal you. <laughs> but what Jesus did on the cross disannuls anything in your life that could disqualify you, including everybody else disqualifying you. Because if you think you're not qualified, how come my prayer is not being answered? Go ask your best friend. Go ask uh, people around you. You will, you will have a ton of Job's comforters and saying, well, you remember last year when you... You know, you remember when you did this and when you did did that? The pointing at it. Look, let's just keep it simple. Christ alone, what Jesus did, eclipses anything that you have or have not done to disqualify you. What Jesus did to qualify you on the cross disannuls anything you've done to disqualify yourself. Uh, the word atone means to forgive, to be merciful. To pacify. You know, God is pacified. What's it going to take for you to answer my prayer? Hey, I'm pacified. I'm pacified. I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. My default answer towards you is yes. yes. The death of the cross motivates the Father to say yes. You know, it's like, what's my motivation? The cross. Oh, yes. God determines his willingness to answer prayer by the value that he places upon the death of the cross. Let me say that again. God determines his willingness to answer your prayer by the value he himself places. Not the value you place, but the value he places upon the death of the cross. Mm -hmm. And so when he, God the Father looks within himself to find his motivation to meet your need, he looks at Jesus and he says, yeah. that's why his answer is always yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and say, so, well, then why isn't it happening? Because we collude in our own delay by, at, by putting something between us and God. We're some religious value, some uh, moral quotient, some uh, concept of delay that's depending upon us and what we do. That's why he gave the law. 
The law is your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. As long as you have some other expectation than Christ, it's like, okay, you just try and work that out. When you get exhausted, <laughs> he'll be waiting. You know, when you drag yourself up out of all those expectations that you think are necessary for you to satisfy before you can get it on with God, when you wear, are you done? Are you done yet? When you're done and you collapse helpless at the cross and realize your need of a Savior, then we'll just bring you across the finish line into breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And and let me tell you something, folks. I know whereof I speak. I know that I can speak eloquently about that territory because uh, my fingerprints are all over it. I've been there. There's nothing that moves the hand of God other than what Christ did for us and who he is to us. And our goal is to plug into and to connect with that. And I think it's a great stopping place. Well, we made it through four verses. Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory. (laughs) Yeah, we went snorkeling again, didn't we? But it's all important, and I appreciate the fact that we can share. And uh, they're not really rabbit trails to us. They are just depths of God that we want to examine. So, Father, thank you for our lesson today. Thank you for where you're taking us. Thank you that uh, we're not satisfied with where we are, and we know you're not satisfied. We're just going to press on into our now every day, and we bless the listeners, Father, with the strength of that life of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed, that it is not just enough, but it's more than enough to meet every need we have according to your riches and glory by one Christ Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.